Hi, very good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us early. Uh, those of you who were earlier, I hope you also managed to find some time to scan the QR code that you see on your screen. Uh, and that will bring you to where you can find some of the latest insights from our team. But right now, we'll begin the webinar. So tonight's webinar topic is pretty interesting. We'll be talking about bonds and ETFs. And without further ado, we'll begin tonight's webinar session. So tonight, we'll be actually getting some of the perspectives from our colleagues, or Ziv, who I'll introduce later, from our products group. So uh, this is part of the Back to Basics webinar series. And before we begin some administrative matters, uh, these are some of the notes that you have to take note of for tonight's webinar session, some important notes. And also an introduction to myself and to the team. So I'm Chan Kin or CK, the guy you see on the left of this slide. Uh, together with me, we have Sam and we have Troy from our team. Uh, but tonight, like I mentioned, we'll also have a guest speaker who I'll introduce. Tonight's focus, actually, once again, it's on the Back to Basics webinar series, and this is actually our last webinar for the series. So those of you who have been following us since day one, start of the year, talking about why trading matters, talking about technical analysis, we have actually come to the end of a pretty long journey, and hopefully that has been interesting for you. We'll do a quick recap first on what we covered last webinar. So last webinar, we also had a guest speaker. We had two of our colleagues from the Futures and FX desk here in OCBC Securities. And we were really talking about an introduction to futures. What are they exactly and how do they work? Along with Forex or FX. And also what are some of the currency pairs that are popularly traded and some of the things to take note of in the FX market, which is way larger than what we might have imagined or expected. Tonight, we'll be talking about another asset class. We'll be talking about bonds and we'll also be talking about ETFs. So we'll be talking about what are bonds, an introduction to bonds, the type of bonds out there, and also some of the things to take note of, such as credit ratings or bond rankings. And then after that, we'll also be looking at ETFs. So an introduction to ETFs in terms of what are the mechanisms, what are the strategies, and some factual uh, fact sheets and how we can actually use practical tips from tonight's session. We'll actually be hearing from our products group colleague. So I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, which will be Ziv. So Ziv is actually from the products group here in OCBC Securities, and he's actually dealing in particular in fixed income, structured products, and ETFs. So without further ado, I'll hand over the time to Ziv. Ziv. So basically, I'm Ziv. I'm from products. I'll be covering bonds and ETF today. Okay. So just to let you know, bonds and ETF, mutual funds, commodities, they're all part of the big asset group. And the big, one of the biggest in the world is actually bond, worth market cap trillions. So for fixed income, a lot of people ask, what exactly are fixed income? Why is it different from bond and stuff? So in, in very simple terms, fixed incomes or they are referred to as bonds are actually debt obligation that corporates or governments issue. Okay, so example, when you invest in a bond, what you're doing essentially is you are lending money to the bond issuer. So example, um, let's say SIA, you are lending money to SIA group. SIA group will um, pay you interest in return for the in return for borrowing money from you. In exchange, what you get is essentially the interest in the form of regular payment called coupons. So typically for bonds, it will be in very large amount. In, sing, in the Singapore market context, Usually, one bond will be of a notional value of seeing 250000 making them out of reach for the typical retail investors. Of course, there are some exceptions. For example, uh, recently, there's a Singapore saving bonds. So it's a 10-year bond, but the, but the minimum denomination is in 1000 sing instead of the usual 250000 sing. But in the, in the world of fixed income trading, we typically trade in notional value of 250,000 or more. Okay. So bond essentially, as you can see in the slide, uh, it is a debt instrument which requires the issuer to pay. So most time people will ask, when will the issuer pay the coupon? When can I get my coupon? 
very simple. On the day one or every day that you hold the bond, you are entitled to the day interest. So let's say every half a year, the issuer will start to pay the coupon. So you receive coupon, 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 coupon. When will it end? You will receive the coupon all the way in most cases. And on the last day, on the maturity day, you receive your principal back as well as your last coupon. So essentially, bonds are suitable or um, they are ideal for investors who wish to hold or receive regular um, regular stream of income. So it's like an annuity product. Every half a year, you get a coupon. So next one, a lot of people or a lot of um, investors will think to themselves, what types of bonds are there? So this is a wide array, but typically we are looking at uh, corporate perpetual, the pink, the pink cloud at the bottom left. We are looking at commercial paper, the one beside. We do have certain uh, bonds like mortgage-backed security. If you recall 2008, 2009, mortgage-backed security was a big thing. And of course, in the recent times, you see a lot of talk about ESG, about green financing, sustainability. So right in the middle, you see this cute green color cloud called the green bonds. So like example, the recent um, government related, they all like to launch green bonds in support for our ESG or rather the, the team to encourage clients to be more conscious of their of the environment and play their part to help make the world a better place. So that's why there's a green bonds. Okay. Mortgage back. Cat catastrophe tips. Okay. So these are some of it. So other than that, what should we take note of when we look at bonds, the types of bonds? Essentially, most bonds fall into four categories. It's taken from PINCO, for example, the least risk, and of course, that means the least return government bonds. For example, your Singapore government bonds like um, Singapore Saving Bonds, they are all under or SIGB, they are all under government bonds insured by the government of Singapore. So in terms of default, in terms of risk and everything is the lowest. And of course, since it's the lowest, typically the return also will be lesser. Next, quasi government bonds. So these are names like your HDB, Maple Tree, the Masek. Next, on higher in terms of returns, you will be looking at investment grade corporate bonds. So names like your, um, like, other investment like maybe SIA groups, all those, you'll be looking at investment grade. And then of course, if you're looking purely from a coupon, high coupon point of view, um, investors who are looking into high yield will be like considering names like Chinese uh, bonds issued by the Chinese investors or Chinese developers. Let's say um, Country Garden, Shinan, so all those which pays very, very high coupon like six, percent and more, 6%, 7%, 8%, those typically we will classify them as high yield. So what are some of the factors affecting bonds? Typically, it is two main ones. The first one major difference is um, for bondholders, they have a creditor claim on the company because they lend money to the company, the company must pay them back money, whereas the other one is like shareholders who hold ownership or equity stake in the company in the form of shares. So two main factors that affect bond prices typically are interest payment. So for example, recently, um, Fed is raising interest rates. So central banks, countries all over the world, they are increasing the cost of borrowing. So the cost for a company to borrow money from you, essentially go up. In return, what they do, they pay you a higher coupon. That's why this will affect the bond prices. Let's say a bond price that is trading at 4%, but the current uh, fixed deposit rate is 4.5. So essentially, we we'll expect the bond prices to fall, to compensate so that the bond prices and the, and the fixed deposit rate will be equally 4.5 or more. That's how a cost will uh, what is one of the major factors affecting bond price. 
The second one is credit rating. So it essentially, what is a credit rating? A credit rating is rated by um, three main rating uh, agency, S&P, Fitch, Moody's. So what it does essentially is to give it a rating, let's say A, all the way to C. Later on in the slide, I will show you. But essentially, the better rating it is, the, it means that there's a higher probability that you get back the money that you lend to the issuer. So investors typically, they love companies, bonds with a very good credit rating. So for government, chances of a government, let's say in Singapore context, Singapore, chances of Singapore government repaying your money is super high. That's why for that, they will pay you a lesser interest because the probability of default is essentially lower. So as you can see, these two factors, cost and credit rating will affect the bond price. In bond rating, what do we look at? This is unlike different asset groups. In essentially, there is a hierarchy within the bonds. So as you can see in this nice triangle, basically what they look at is the debt obligation that corporates or government issue right at the bottom, which is of the highest risk and the lowest priority in terms of repayment. You see equity going up, preferred. Then the next one, subordinated. And right at the pinnacle, you see senior debt. What, it, what senior debt essentially means is that it has the lowest fees and the highest probability that you get back your principal as well as all your bonds. Okay, so, but of course, lowest risk doesn't mean no risk. Next, credit rating. So just now, earlier on, we mentioned a lot about credit rating. So essentially, this slide is for you to, to show you what is the um, type of credit rating? So on your left, you will see Moody's, S&P, Fitch, as well as a description from highest credit quality all the way down to near default or default. So there is a, there is a, different, there is a line that shows um, the distinction between investment grade and high yield. So anything investment grade essentially is a good credit rating. But of course, if you want a higher coupon, then most times you will be looking into high yield or speculative grade. Essentially, it's BB plus by S&P or BA1 by Moody's. So essentially, in the world of um, fixed income trading, we will always be looking into credit worthiness because that will determine whether you will get your principal back, which is most important for most, for most investors. Next topic that I'll touch on is essentially exchange traded funds. So for ETF, I'm sure Chunky and Troy previously, as well as Samuel has covered, it is an asset group on its own. But most time when we hear ETF, do we really know what exactly is an ETF? So let me walk you through the journey. For ETF, what is an ETF? Essentially, an ETF is the type of fund that owns an underlying asset. The underlying asset can be in the form of um, different asset groups, like for example, in stocks, in bonds, in oil future, even in gold bar, the physical gold bar, you can also do that. But essentially what is an ETF is that it, it is an open-ended investment fund listed, traded on a stock exchange. The primary aim is to track the performance of the line index or asset class. So for example, the ETF could be tracking a basket of stocks, basket of um, bonds, or purely just on precious metal. Uh, some people, when they look at oil in, in, like in our practical world, where people drive, you always look at the prices of oil, the gas pump, and they're like, oh, prices are going up. But essentially, let's say you have an ETF that tracks the price of um, oil futures, when, when petrol prices go up, you might be, hey, I'm actually making some money. <laughs> Essentially, that is a direct application of a real world, how an ETF can help investors in their portfolio. But of course, go, moving forward, ETF is a basket of assets, securities, and each share of the ETF represents a proportionate ownership of the asset. So throughout the um, slides, I will share with you how we can look at ETF, what we should be looking out for, uh, when we look at ETF. So 
Likewise, for most um, big asset groups, there are, there are always this main topic called types or categories. Essentially, we will be looking at um, different types. For example, it can range from equity, fixed income, commod, to even very specific or very niche area like factors, teams, for example, and even alternative. So for example, um, cryptocurrency, which was the top of town last year, it is in, in the form of cryptocurrency and ETF. Let's say most investors want to um, dabble or venture into cryptocurrency, but they do not want to be like holding ledgers or whichever. They can always hold it through an ETF, lower risk, and it can uh, be in the form of exchange. So there's more liquidity. Of course, if you look into something that is of a longer term, equity and fixed income ETF are actually more common. And then, of course, we will also have like specific themes, like minimum volatility. So in today's context, where things are swinging pretty well, volatility, we have like ETF, with, um, which, which their investment mandate is to limit on the volatility. So it keeps things stable and nice to the best of their ability so that investors like yourself can just... Um, stay invested and of course let's say some of it if they pay dividends you can just be collecting your dividends and all and of course there is the growth team esg team so some of the names like for equities um, etf under active management you guys could have heard of uh, katie wood arc arc invest is one example of uh, equity as well as actively managed so there are different combinations you can mix and match so long as um, there's an etf out there that you're interested in I'm sure you can find something that you like. So for example, being very practical, what is one theme that we should be looking at? ESG. Why ESG? According to ETF GI, the asset under management grew to record 390 billion last year. So essentially what we are looking at, there were a total of 885 ESG ETF with 337 new ESG ETF being launched worldwide as of this year. So that means that, uh, as every day we are looking at one, at the birth of one ESG ETF every single day. So essentially this theme um, is in accordance with, of course, the government, central banks all over. Why? Because we want people to be more aware, to be aware of what we uh, investor will ask. We want people to, we want to raise awareness so that people will take care of the country. To take care not only of the country, but of the environment so that um, both their future generations and themselves, they can all be, all be um, have a place to stay, have a good environment. So essentially, such a broad idea or such a good um, base, like let's say ESG teams, do work for your, for your planet and all, it can essentially form a team. And this team can be practically applied into an ETF. So a lot of investors say, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. I want to do good, but does it come at a cost? So essentially, this um, study shows that every day there is a new ETF launch means there are sufficient interests, there are sufficient people who want to make a change to, to not just the planet. Uh, they want to do something for the future generation as well as for their friends and peers and family. They can do so through, example, a ESG team. Of course, there are other teams out there. Like earlier in the slide, there are the, all the different themes that you can explore. The next one, most people will be asking, ETF. So how does it track the index? Most investors will ask. Essentially, it falls into three main groups. The first one, full replication. Second one, synthetic. And third, partial. So what is a full replication? So basically, let's say you buy into an ETF that invest into 50 stocks. This, the fund manager will take, after um, raising all the funds, he will take the money and buy all 50 stocks in uh, accordance with the weightage in the fund fact sheet. And then you will have, essentially you're holding into a fund that holds all 50 stocks. So whatever that the ETF tracks, you are, you are essentially an owner of that. So that is what is a full replication. Synthetic replication, typically they'll use derivative like um, swaps. They might be using futures. 
um, to just to replicate. Why do they do that? For example, some of the some of the instrument that they want to replicate, it's not possible to do it by a by a physical holding. For example, let's say um, there's an ETF that tracks commodity or bits or whatever or whatever. You can't be expecting the fund manager to be buying uh wheat to be buying barley and storing in the storeroom somewhere because the cost is very high. That's why they always use a synthetic replication to, for example, commodity to store. But essentially, what this means for an investor point of view is that let's say I am of the view that commodity will continue to rise or wheat or whichever. And then um, because such goods are perishable, you can always have uh, exposure through an ETF, which is a synthetic replication of the underlying. So it is one practical way that um, synthetic replication works. The next one, partial replication. What is a partial replication? Essentially, partial replication means that it is a, a sampling. So part of it you take out and then you buy. So it invests only in a sample that are needed to, to achieve a performance. The next question people will ask or investors will be interested to find out. Uh, when, why is it different from full replication? Why not just use a full replication? The reason is very simple. Let's say you are investing into or you or investor wish to invest into a very broad index. Let's say MSCI world, where it could consist of all the developed uh, countries, economies within MSCI world. Does that mean that the fund manager need to buy all the stocks listed in all the different countries? Then the cost will be very high. So what they do is they take a sample. Or oh, let's say uh, within Singapore, you will take a few uh, stocks that are very representative, like maybe the financial stocks, um, SGX, SIA, whichever, and then we put it together to represent Singapore exposure. Then for India, we do it the same. For China, we do it the same. Essentially, this is to keep costs low and to replicate the whole developed economy as much as possible. That's where the partial replication is a real life application. Next, most time, I'm sure like if investors go to the banks or go to um, certain financial institutions, other than ETF, you hear names like unit trust. So, and then most of them will share with you about unit trust, which is a sort of fun. So what exactly is the difference? Allow me to share with you on the short comparison. Most times for exchange traded funds, they are traded on stock exchange, contrary to mutual fund or unit trust. Mutual fund, unit trust, essentially, they are the same. It's just a naming convention. Sometimes some prefer to call it mutual fund. Sometimes they prefer call it unit trust. But what other than that, exchange traded funds, like the name suggests, trades on an exchange. Whereas for a mutual fund, it is open ended, but it is not traded on an exchange. It is usually bought and sold through private channels. So, like your banks, like your financial institutions, you can always do that for um, subscribing to mutual funds. And then for exchange traded funds, usually there's an underlying. So, most times it tracks the performance according to the index. This is the main, um, this is the two main difference between a mutual fund and an exchange traded funds. So in terms of exchange traded funds, you see the price bid us. But for mutual fund, it could be quite far off. You'll be looking at NAV and stuff. This is a short table compiled um, for, for your easy reference. You see ETF, stocks, and unit trust. Essentially, what in terms of like diversification, price transparency, intraday trading, you can see it within ETF. So it's similar to stocks. Just that for stocks, you do not have a lot of diversification because it's a single company. But for ETF, you could be owning um, owning 50 companies or 30 companies through an ETF, which is a sales medium. I mean, which is a medium. And essentially, you can also be entitled to dividends. So this is consistent among ETF stocks and unit trust. And of course, you can always trade this through your broker. But for unit trust, because it's not listed on exchange, it's through private channels and all, you will not be able to trade through a broker. 
So moving on, we will be looking at the entry, holding, and exit costs. Essentially, unit trust they have very um they have front end charges of about three to about five percent, and of course, uh, comparatively, ETF will have a lower let's say management charge or custody fees, and of course, certain unit trust when you want to sell, you want to liquidate your position, there might be exit charges, um, typically around one to two percent, but of course. For ETF, there's like standard brokerage fees, like stocks, um, like, for, for, like stocks. Okay, then the next one for ETF, most times um, people think of ETF as a passive investment where you buy into a fund that invests into its underlying or track the underlying, and then you do not need to do much. I mean, do need to do much uh, trading. So one advocator for ETF is Warren Buffett, where you invest in the index, where you invest in the ETF, and then it doesn't work. But essentially, in recent times, we see the birth or the hyper growth of active managed ETF. The best epitome of some of uh, active ETF is actually like up. I'm sure most of you might have um, seen it or heard it somewhere. So, so actually, like let's say during the COVID um, time span, Active ETF has grown in popularity. Why? Because it will demonstrate the, the um, skill set of the fund manager to actively select and buy stocks. But essentially, it is still um, this ETF is still um, traded on the exchange. So in terms of liquidity, in terms of intraday trading, uh, investors can still trade intraday, unlike that of a mutual fund. So how do I invest in ETF? After hearing so much, I'll just jump straight. How do you start? So ETF trades just like any regular stocks. You can buy it through your respective brokers. Um, the charges in terms of brokerage commission charges is essentially all the same. Each ETF unit traded represents an existing in, uh, investment. And of course, ETF holdings are transparent. So you can go to the website, um, the different issuer, ETF issuer, you can go to your website, you can check for oh, what's your top 10 or what is all of their full list of their, of their holdings, what's inside the ETF, it's all transparent. Next, what are the advantages? So for ETF, essentially what it does is there's flexibility, it is cost efficient, it, uh, it provides diversification, it is transparent, so you always know what you're getting into. It provides liquidity because it's traded on the exchange. You can trade it intraday, like I mentioned. And definitely one of the main points is that it allows instant access to international market. So you can have ETF listed on um, Singapore Stock Exchange. You can have it listed on um, Hang Seng or Hong Kong. You can have it in um, US, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, all of it. But essentially, ETF are known to be cost effective because they often have low man lower management fee compared to active funds and the costs are easier to calculate. Since we have touched on advantage, it's only fair that I share with you on the disadvantage. So essentially, like all investment, um, ETF carries a risk of market risk. The change of the market condition will affect the price. So which constitute to the NAV. So it can be higher, it can be lower. The next one, let's say like earlier I shared, you gain access to international market. So when you gain access to international market, let's say in the US, what are you, what kind of risk are you exposed to? Definitely the first thing to come to mind is US dollar. So US dollar is foreign exchange risk. So foreign exchange risk can arise when the currency held is different from our base currency. Let's say USD appreciate against SING, we could have been earning additional to what is the price difference of the asset. But of course, the other way could happen. It means that let's say SING strengthened against the SING so much. Oh, sorry, SING strengthened against the USD. USD came down, so you could be facing a temporary uh, foreign currency loss. Essentially, this will affect your realized and unrealized profit of the investment. And for ETF, the main thing that will uh, determine what is the difference is the tracking error. 
So because like earlier I mentioned, ETF tracks the uh, underlying. So let's say how closely it tracks the um, underlying will be called the tracking error risk. So let's say if it's very far off, let's say both prices went up by $3, but because it's very far off, your ETF could be only going up by like $2 instead of $3 in a very simple, easy to understand analogy. So this is why tracking error is uh, quite a major risk for, for most ETF. Okay, the next one, market mechanism, net asset value, or we call NAV. So what it does is essentially, or what it is, is, is essentially the value of the ETF asset. It's calculated by divided, dividing the total net asset value, total asset, by the numbers or units of spending. The NAV of the ETF is calculated every day, at the end of every day, after the close of the exchange, and typically published on the second business day after the relevant dealing day. So essentially, this is uh, quite similar and quite transparent. Okay, next one, on a very practical approach, most people will be asking, so I know about fixed income, I heard about ETF, so what's next? What is next is uh, some of the very um, practical, very simple kind of portfolio strategy that you can apply straight. So being a very practical person, I always be asking, oh, since I know about this, how can I apply it straight? For portfolio strategy, the ETF selection starts with understanding the type. So earlier on, I mentioned there's different types. What is the type that interests you? What is the type that you want to explore in the market? And then we look at how the unit feature can match your needs. We must remember that the core objective of an ETF is to produce a return that tracks a specific index, not to outperform it. So if you're looking into outperformance, you could essentially be, should be looking into mutual funds uh, or a very active manage, actively managed um, fund instead of uh, ETF. But then of course, we should not forget that um, our own life goals such as retirement, education, kids' education, um, or, or even in the pure, purest form, capital appreciation, be it long term or short term is essential to selecting the right combination of ETF. Next, I can should be showing to you my example core strategy. So you see the big blue moon that reads ETF, and then we have like active strategy one to three. So what it does is the main um, component or composite of your overall portfolio is largely in ETF, and then you have like um, short term or thematics, uh, thematic strategy like active strategy into um, the subsector that you are interested in. So essentially, the core, like let's say, um, example, seventy plus percent, eighty plus percent of the ET uh, of your portfolio will be in ETF, and the rest can be in other form of asset groups or other types of ETF. But the main thing is that you want to have exposure to a diversified basket via ETF. And then the remaining one, you can use it to capture alpha, or we call a uh, uh, short-term returns. The other one is the opposite satellite. So it's called a satellite. The main one is your main portfolio. And then circulating around it, you use the individual ETF, um, ETF to capture alpha. So these individual um, pockets of ETF or ETF strategies, right? will be to complement your main portfolio. So all this will be more um, tactical or more thematic that actually fall back to your main portfolio, which will typically be a longer term or, or long to mid to long term kind of strategy. Whereas the ETF, ETF strategy can be like more on sectorial or more short term, depending on how investor like to use it. So the next one, top criteria for picking an ETF. In a very recent poll conducted for investors, number of respondents is like 762. The AUM and liquidity is the top priority, as well as like um, it is made out of 68, 68%. So what it essentially signal is that when an investor wants to buy an ETF or they choose an ETF, what they are looking is 
the AUM, how big is it? How liquid is it? How, how many people in the world are trading it? Not just in a local country, local context. What is the benchmark index use? Uh, what is the ETF provider brand name market position? Is it is this issue unheard of? Or is it like um, blasted all over the news channel or marketing channel, for example? Is it something that I can relate to as an investor that I've seen it, that I can um, heard it before? Next one, we will always be looking into performance, like historical performance. But of course, as we all know, historical performance is not representative of the future. So we, can, we should not be relying on historical performance only. Of course, then we'll be looking at management fee, transaction fee. But what is another top priority is the benchmark index, especially towards institutional investors, where they will be looking at certain strategy and they want the ETF to perform a specific function. So examples of ETF. In-house here at Lion OC, uh, here at OCBC Securities, we have collaboration with Lion Global Investors. So this is our own ETF that we developed in-house. So some of the houses, they, they might have the expertise so that they can um, promote more on ETF. For us, we have the Lion OCBC Securities ETF series. The first one which was launched is, I'm, I'm sure most of you might have heard it, is the Lion OCBC Securities Hang Seng Tech ETF. So at the bottom, you'll see, it captured the growth potential of the 30 largest team, tech team companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So that is similar to uh, the index. What is, it that, what is it that this ETF is looking at or wants to do? Next one that we have in our suite is the Lion OCBC Securities China Leaders ETF. It's the 80 largest stock connect eligible Chinese companies. So like the likes of Ping An, uh, Mao Tai, ICBC Tencent, and of course the Lion OCBC Securities Singapore Low Carbon ETF. So essentially this is to gain access to 50 largest, uh, 50 Singapore companies with a lower carbon footprint. Earlier on, I mentioned about ESG team. So this one example that, oh, this is something that uh, of uh, actual ETF that's launched based on ESG concerns. So all the, all the different types that I mentioned can be, um, can be, can be existingly in the form of a pre-existing ETF, or it can be um, in the later, later part of time where people will search and then they can find the different teams. So now I'll just walk you through a practical, um, practical session about understanding the fact sheet so that at least um, when, we, when we leave the session, it's something that you can straight away apply, it can something that you can straight away use. Most time, for most ETF, we will always go to the issuer provider. In this case, for illustration purposes, it's Lion Global Investor. So you go to the website, you go to um, a particular fund that you might be looking at or interested in, under fund documents, there's always this document called fact sheet. Apart from prospectors for the highlight sheet, we'll explore the fact sheet together and I'll just walk you through the fact sheet shortly. Next one, let's say other than fact sheet, the other thing, other factor that's very important, like I mentioned, that institutional investors or big, uh, big investors they will look at is what is the underlying index. In this case, uh, is the IH OCBC Singapore Low Carbon Select 50 Cap Index. This one is the, the index that the ETF closely tracks. So where can we find this? For example, this is available on SGX website for free. So people can go in and see one year performance, five year performance, how it's functioning, everything is there. So other than just the ETF performance, we should also be concerned, concerning ourselves with how the index perform. I'll walk you through the fact sheet. Okay, so for this. This is the, for example, the Lion 
um, this Lion OCBC Security Singapore Low Carbon ETF. This is the fact sheet. Right at the top, you will see the, the month, August 2022. Every month, the funds will update the latest fact sheet and, the, and that investor who are interested can download and look at it. The first paragraph will show the investment objective. So this is essentially very important for, for investors. Why? Because it lists the investment objective for the fund. So it says, is to replicate as closely as possible the performance of the IHOCBC Singapore Low Carbon Select 50 Cap Index, which is the one that we find at, um, on SGX website. And then you will see using a direct investment policy. So earlier on, I mentioned about the replication strategy. This is a direct investment policy. So it will buy into all of the stocks that is listed within the like, um, low carbon ETF. Okay. The next one, it will explain more on why this particular index, which is the weighted average carbon intensity. So earlier I mentioned ESG, such a novel theme, it can also be um, applied into an ETF. So what does it do? What does it want to do or achieve? This one is essentially we want to, this fund wants to decarbonize through, and how do you decarbonize and want to measure it? They use this method methodology called the weighted average carbon intensity to measure. So based on GHG emission, but that's not the main point. <laughs> the next one, we will be looking at our fund packs. For example, we should be looking at when is the fund incepted? Uh, what is the history? So for example, this fund since 28th of April 2022, so it's a very recent this year, uh, launched this year. You see the benchmark index that I keep emphasizing on what is it tracking. Next one we'll be looking at is the manager. Who is the ma fund manager for this particular fund? Uh, what is the base currency over here? Base currency, trading currency, sing dollar and USD. Why does it matter? Because for some, they might be holding USD. They don't want to convert back to sing or the other way around. So certain ETF can be available in different trading currency. Where is it listed? Remember ETF is, um, you can trade on an exchange. So in this case, it's listed on the Singapore exchange. Trading board lot size. What is the minimum number of shares that you can buy? One unit you can buy already. Subscription mode, cash is very typical, but in Singapore context, you can even be buying ETF or different asset class through SRS, which is Supplementary Retirement Scheme. The management fee, distribution frequency. Why this is important? Some ETF, they actually distribute dividends. So like um, maybe in a year, there could be two payouts. So while holding this ETF, you are, investors are rewarded with dividends payment. Okay. The fund size, how big is this entire fund? So in this case, it's sing dollar 59.4 million. The total number of units. Next, let's say uh, investors who wish to find out, oh, this index, how, where should I go? Or how should I look at this index? Over there, there's an index Bloomberg ticker. So essentially, you can launch the Bloomberg app, which is free for download for most. You can just take key in a ticker for sing dollar, you will see ESG, SG. For US, ESG, US, you can easily find information about this online. So there's a lot of transparency. Okay, the fund code, stock code. Next, I will also share with you about what's in the fact sheet. What else should we um, concern ourselves with? Essentially, for most investors, we will be looking at the securities holding and weightage, which is let's say the top 10, top 20, top 30 of what this. ETF fund invests itself into. For example, 7.8% of the entire out of 100% is invested into Singtel, Singapore Telecoms Limited stocks, followed by 7.7% into OCBC stocks, 7.2% into DBS stocks, 6.8% into UOB stocks. So essentially, our three um, bank, local banks are covered within this ETF. So for example, investor who, who, wants, to, who wants to invest into uh, Singapore, they can do it through this uh, particular ETF. 
let's say um, some companies, um, some investor, they want to invest into um, certain US exposure. For example, the fourth one, fourth counter, you see Flextronic International at 5.2% is actually the US is the stock. So this is one way that uh, ETF, let's say, is available in SIN and USD. It's not limited to just Singapore stock. This is a clear example where within the top holdings, you can um, look at it. What the fund invest into, this is why most investors, they look at um, not just the, the investment mandate, but as well as what inside, what is inside the top 10 holdings or top 20 holdings in this case. Essentially, um, let's say investor like a particular company, like let's say I like Olam Group. Right at the second column, you will see I see Olam Group limited 0.9%. But essentially, Olam Group, let's say I don't want to have a direct exposure, I just want part of it, I can do it through an ETF also. That is one way that investor can gain um, exposure through an ETF. And essentially, let's say Olam's is largely in commodity. I feel uncomfortable investing all my money into a commodity straight. I can do it through an ETF where it is clearly diversified because out of this whole hundred percent, Olam just made out of 0.9%. So I'm actually gaining access to a basket. The next way to look at an um, ETF fact sheet is we look at what is the sub-industry allocation. Let's say there's different sectors, but the largest, let's say real estate, makes up 28.3, followed by financials at 27.1. So straight away, I know, oh, this particular uh, ETF invests primarily into real estate and financials. Of course, there are different subsectors, like let's say technology, the next biggest one at 13.2%. Ah, that I know, okay. So this one, not only just the financials, like the top uh, five names that you see with the heaviest weightage above here, we see, OCBC, DBS, UOB. At first glance, most people might thought, oh, this is just a financial uh, financial investment like into financial companies, but not true. The biggest is actually real estate and not financial. So it is one way that investor can keep a lookout to make sure that what they're investing is what they are looking out for in the first place. Next, we will see the fund performance. So in this case, you see um, it's all NA, not applicable. Reason is because this fund is just incepted this year at, on the 28th of April, 2022. So there's not, uh, no data available. Okay. The next one, essentially, for most uh, fact sheet, is uh, all the disclaimer and notes. So most of the info important information that investors should be looking out on is in the first page. So that's why I always advocate um, or ask my in investors, family and friends, to always, number one, be clear about what is their core objective, what they want to achieve, and then uh, find all the information within the first page of our fact sheet. So with that, I walk you through the, um, the fact sheet, and that is uh, one way that uh, you can look into for information. We to, for if you are looking to buy a TF or looking to buy um, whichever asset group, you can always do it through um, ETF. And of course, um, for those that wish to be a bigger, let's say, uh, wants to receive a consistent cash flow, you can do it through fixed income, like through the bond. So I've come to the end of the session. I'll just pass it back to Chunky. Okay, thanks very much, Ziv, uh, for that pretty informative and actually pretty heavy session as well. Uh, I do know that many of you have some comments or questions that you have put into the chat or into the Q&A box. Do keep those questions coming. Uh, we might not be able to address them all because there are quite a few questions, but we'll do our best to actually address them uh, directly to you at the end of the session as well. So do feel free to continue to drop any of the questions or comments that you have into the chat. Uh, and I'll just be running through some of the administrative matters right now as well, uh, because some of you have asked some questions about those. 
So one of the questions that uh, we have been asked in the chat is actually all about, uh, you know, we have come to the end of our Back to Basics webinar series. Will there be any replays or, or any recordings available or will we do this session again? So actually with that, um, just some introduction to those of you who might not have known, uh, we are actually active on YouTube. So all our sessions from this year's Back to Basics webinar series, you can actually find them on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can just go to youtube.com and search OCBC Securities and you'll be able to find some of the content that we have, not just in terms of back to basics webina uh, webinars or educational content, but also some more timely trading sensitive content, uh, such as our monthly trading matters webinar with Sam as well, uh, along with some of our podcast recordings. Uh, together with that, we are also active on Spotify. So uh, again, this is more uh, targeted, not so much on an educational angle, but really all about trading. So we'll be talking about the latest trends, latest insights, uh, latest stocks that are hot in the market because of some uh, interesting news or interesting uh, trends that are happening. So you can find us on Spotify as well. Uh, just search Trading Matters by OCBC Securities in your Spotify and do click the subscribe or follow button uh, along with the notifications button so that you do get uh, updated whenever we have some of the latest content. Along with that, uh, uh, we have an upcoming webinar that will be spearheaded by Sam, just as I mentioned, Trading Matters with Sam. That will be happening, uh, I think, two Mondays from now on the 31st of October. And that's where we'll actually run through some of the latest market movements. Uh, so some pretty interesting content. Right now, we have the upcoming US midterm elections. We have the ongoing China Party Congress. So some of these big global events, how would they affect the stock markets? Do stay tuned for this upcoming event or webinar on the 31st of October, just before November starts. With that, uh, those of you who are early for this session, you have managed to scan the QR code. Otherwise, you can feel free to do so right now as well. Uh, and that will bring you to our website where we also have some of the written content talking about the latest thematics and latest stock highlights from our team as well. So do stay tuned for more details on the website uh, as well as some of the latest content that we have. So with that, actually, we have come to the end of the presentation portion of our webinar. Uh, and right now, like I mentioned, if you have any other questions, do drop it into the chat. We'll be responding to you directly one on one. Or if we are not able to because there are quite a lot of questions, then um, you can get in contact with your trading representative here at OCBC Securities as well, and they'll be able to help you along the way as well. So any questions you have regarding our latest webinar, all about bonds and ETFs, or otherwise any other trading related content, our earlier session on FX and uh, futures, or even things like technical analysis, you can either check out our YouTube channel for some of the replays of those webinars, or otherwise do check in with your trading representatives as well. So right now, we'll actually be ending the webinar session. Uh, and thank you so much. We'll try to stay back a bit to answer some of your questions. Uh, otherwise, to those of you who have joined us all the way, thank you so much. Uh, and we know we are also running a little bit late on time as well. Uh, but yeah, we really appreciate you guys joining us. And we hope to see you at our next webinar, 31st of October, Trading Matters with Sam. Thank you.